Welcome back. Now, let's see what we can all remember. And sorry for the delay in the the next video. It's uh, been a while to actually put all these together with people who are setting these exams and ultimately finding the little trick questions that they are. Before we go any further, please like, subscribe, and share. Um, the only way I can keep making and updating these videos is if people share them, otherwise it's pointless me doing it. But thank you to everyone who is watching, and I hope these are valuable. Thanks for all the feedback that people have been giving me. Um, feel free to reach out at any time. Wherever I can help, I will. And if I can't, there's going to be other people that are following this that, that can. So share your thoughts, um, and certainly provide feedback where you can. But thanks all for, for ta taking the time to run these. So... How much is the fine for smoking on board a domestic flight? Is it A, $1,000, B, $2,500, C, 5000 or D, 10000 And that's smoking on board a domestic flight. From 91.5, remember that passengers must comply with the instructions given to them by the pilot in command and 91203 covers off that the pilot in command can refuse or disembark anyone who causes danger to the aircraft or does not comply with his instructions. Also from 91211, the conditions on which smoking is allowed or not allowed must be part of the safety brief. So it is down to the pilot to be able to make sure that he uh, reiterates the fact that there is no smoking on the flight. And section 96A6 states that no person can smoke while on board any aircraft operated by New Zealand's international airline carrying passengers on any route designated as a non-smoking smoking route, smoking, smoking route pursuant to this section. This means international flights. Six, section 65N states that no smoking on internal, which is domestic, flights that are operated for hire and reward and the fine for smoking is up to $2,500. Okay, what options does the pilot in command have if a passenger appears drunk or under the influence of drugs when boarding an aircraft? Can he A. Initiate a search of the passenger's luggage to see if illegal drugs are being carried? B. Does it allow him? Uh, does it uh, allow him to allow the passenger on board the aircraft as long as they are handcuffed to a seat? So I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh at these ones. Um, so that they cannot harm any other passengers. C. Refusal to let the passenger on board the aircraft. Or D. Calling the aircraft operator who can say if the passenger can board or not. It is C. Refusal to let the passenger on board the aircraft pilot and command always has the final say and that's addressed in 91203 the authority of the pilot in command which clearly states that each pilot in command of an aircraft shall give any commands necessary for the safety of the aircraft and the persons and property carried on that aircraft including disembarking or refusal the carriage of any person who appears to be under the influence of alcohol or any drug where in the opinion of the pilot in command, their carriage is likely to endanger the aircraft or its occupants, and then it goes on and on and on. I don't know why I've got a B for 20B, but let's let's run this through. Oh, I remember why I put it in there now. Because this was a question, an actual exam question that that had, had, had been set. And it had some spurious connotations. So, what options does the pilot in command have if a crew member appears drunk or under the influence of drink, of, of drink or drugs but not on duty? Sneaky one. A. To initiate a search of the crew member's luggage to see if any illegal drugs are being carried. B. To allow the crew member to board the aircraft as they are not on duty. C. Refusal to let the crew member board the aircraft, or D. Call the aircraft operator to, uh, who can say if the crew member can or cannot board. So this, this one is a variation on the one previous. The answer is B. You can allow the crew member to board the aircraft as they are not on duty. But 
Again, pursuant to the previous section, if you believe that they are likely to cause uh, endangerment or anything else. So you can allow an intoxicated, well, intoxicated, you can allow a, uh, a crew member who has been drinking um, on the flight as long as they're not on duty. So no crew member, pilot or flight attendant, whilst on duty can be in any state of intoxication or any other state that will affect the ability to carry out the duty. Note this includes sedatives or illegal drugs, but you can allow the crew member to board if they have been drinking because they are not on duty. Now, that was probably a badly worded question. And you're guaranteed to find them. Uh, right. 21. Which of the following portable electronic devices is not allowed to be operated on board during critical phases of flight? Pacemakers, portable voice recorders, electric shavers, or none of the above. Mm, yep. None of the above. Cell phones and other devices that transmit electromagnetic energy must not be used while an aircraft is in flight. But it has to be flying IFR, which is where the interference causes problems. Um, all portable electronic devices must not be operated when an aircraft flying IFR is carrying out an instrument departure or an approach procedure during or during any other critical phase of flight under the IFR umbrella, but this does not apply to hearing aids, pacemakers, portable voice recorders, electric shavers, or electronic watches. So again, reread the question. Which of the following portable electronic devices is not allowed to be operated on board during critical phases of flight? None of the above. They are all allowed to be operated. God forbid you ever turn off a pacemaker. Ugh, that's a tough one. Um, so... Read the question, read the question again, then answer it. All right? So, the primary devices that the, the act does not apply to is hearing aids, pacemakers, portable voice recorders, electric shavers, and electronic watches. Any other devices which operate on the aircraft um, has determined that will not cause interference. Okay, so... Um, Electronic watches, interesting, especially with the Bluetooth connectivity and Wi-Fi capabilities of a lot of watches. And now watches are coming out that have uh, 3G and uh, 4G connectivity. Um, but this has to be done on the type of aircraft you wish to use the device on. After the first aircraft has been determined to be okay to use that device on the pilot in command, or the operator may approve that same device, on different aircraft, i.e. Air New Zealand may determine that iPods will not cause interference on the A320 aircraft. Air New Zealand or the PIC could then determine that it's okay um, for the iPod to be used on a, an A380 or a 787. Um, but yeah, again, tricky, be careful, read, reread, then answer. Question 22 is, is a firearm allowed to be carried on board an aircraft in the cabin? Uh, a, yes, as long as the firearm is disabled. B, yes, only if livestock are on board. C, yes, only if the aircraft is being used by people associated with that firearm and the operator has said that it may be onboarded, um, but it must be disabled, or D, no. Question again, is the firearm allowed to be carried on board um, an aircraft in the cabin? And the answer is yes, only if the aircraft is being used by people associated and only associated with the firearm. And the operator has said it may be onboarded, but it must be in a disabled state. Firearms can be carried on board an aircraft if they are stowed in a place inaccessible to every person during that flight, um, and the firearm is disabled, or the firearm may be in the cabin if the aircraft is being used only by people who are associated with that fire firearm. So, small little hunting trip, fine, everyone on board um, uh, can can be carrying a, a, a disabled firearm. Um, pilot must be able to ascertain that these things have been disabled. Um, if livestock is being flown and a firearm is considered necessary by the operator to immobilise that livestock for the safety of the aircraft, I don't know, transforming a horse and it just... 
blows a gasket, you want to be able to take care of that before it does serious damage to your aircraft or the passengers. If the aircraft is being used to shoot or immobilize animals on the ground, the firearm must not be loaded until you're flying in the area of the firearm is going to be discharged, and only the people on board the aircraft are part of that operation. You must not discharge the firearm if it will cause a hazard to person or property on the ground. You must not discharge a firearm over a city, town or settlement, or over open air events. So, in a nutshell, is a firearm allowed to be carried on board an aircraft in the cabin? It really depends on who else is on board. Um, but irrespective, it must be in a disabled state. The answer to this particular question, although relatively ambiguous, is the fact that yes, it can as long as the entire flight is associated, everyone on that flight is associated um, with that flight. Um, and obviously, blanket rule must be disabled until the, 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 the time by which it needs to be used. So if it is a hunt and you are shooting livestock from an open canopy, especially for, for helicopter pilots, um, otherwise it must be out of reach of, of general population if the flight's being shared. And I know it doesn't tell you much about that, um, but it does in the answer. So again, read read the answers carefully. But it's more importantly to understand the connotation. So if there are, if it's a shared flight, um, then realistically it needs to be put in uh, a hold or away from the general populace, and it must be disabled. If everyone on the flight is associated with the carriage or the use of that firearm, um, then it then it can be stored in the cabin, um, but still in a disabled state. Um, and if it's being used while in the air for hunting, i.e. open-sided helicopter for a livestock cull, um, which is done by the air, yes, it can be, but it can only be enlivened um, uh, during the time of operation and over the particular area. And those are the kind of main variations in that question, or the, the question may be the same, but the answers might be different. Read the answers, understand what they're asking. 23. Which of the following locations can you not place your carry-on baggage? Uh, A. On the seat next to you. B. In the overhead lockers. C. Underneath the seat in front of you. D. In the seat pocket in front of you. I suppose D is specifically pertinent to how big the carry-on luggage is. The answer is a on the seat next to you all right so overhead lockers everyone's been on a, on, a, on, a, on a Qantas or an Air New Zealand or a an SA Airways uh, flight um, in the locker above you as long as it's shut and secure um, on uh, underneath the seat in front of you because it cannot uh, affect uh, as long as it cannot affect anything uh, rolling around uh, in the seat pocket of you because it's still secured and if you suddenly uh, lost altitude it's not going to become this flailing object in the cabin uh, while you're in a positive or negative G and it's going to float around and then I don't know, decapitate, take an eye out um, or generally up, make someone having a bad day. The rule covers the carry-on baggage only. This must be in baggage lockers or under the passenger seat as long as it cannot slide forward and hinder the evacuation of an emergency for final takeoff and landing. If you see the word cargo, different rule applies. All right, so again, keep an eye out. And funny enough, which of the following places can you not place any cargo? A, a secure secured to the seat next to you in an overhead locker in an aircraft hold or in the aisle next to you in the aisle because as we said before you can't um, get in the way of uh, an emergency exit uh, and it cannot move to a point where it can uh, objectively restrict someone uh, trying to get out of the aircraft so, rule applies to cargo only. Note, cargo must be either on a seat, in a cargo rack or bin, in a cargo or baggage compartment. The cargo must be properly secured so that it will not shift under normal anticipated flight conditions, i.e. basic expected turbulence. 
Um, it should also be packaged and covered to avoid injuries to passengers. Seats, berths and floors have load limitations which must not be exceeded. Aisles and emergency exits must not be blocked. Question 25. What are the requirements to carry out formation flights? A. You must fly as close together as possible. B. You may only carry out formation flying for hire and reward. C. You must arrange the formation flights with other pilots before commencing the flight. D. You must ensure that all aircraft transponders are switched on so ATC can track the formation of the flight. Of course, the answer is C. You must arrange the formation flights with other pilots before commencing the flights. The others are very, very, very against all civil aviation rules. Um, you must not fly your aircraft close to another aircraft where you can create a collision hazard, except if you have arranged before the flight with the other aircraft to carry out that formation flight. You must not carry out any formation flight while carrying passengers that are paying unless you have arranged this with the aircraft. With the aircraft? Hmm. Um, before flight uh, and you are operating a parachuting flight or an adventure aviation formation. And common sense, you must not ensure that all aircraft transponders are switched on, especially when you're flying in formation, because generally it's just going to be this wedge of unreadable numbers for ATC. Uh, there is another question floating out there that says, um, a variation of uh, how should transponders or SSR codes be displayed while in formation, and that is that one agreed uh, uh, one agreed pilot will have a transponder code, the others as predetermined and prearranged and pre-notified, um, so that it can be tracked by only one code. Okay. 26. When are you allowed to drop an object from your aircraft? A. Never, which does make perfect sense. B. Whenever you're over the property that the item needs to be dropped. Um, again, that's not that far from the creative drone usage that we will be seeing thanks to Amazon. C. When you have ensured that the item will be observed by a person on the ground for safety. And D. If you are sure that the object will not endanger people or property. I'm not going to get into that. Right. Um, D. Is the correct answer. Uh, you may drop an object as long as you have taken precautions to ensure that the object does not endanger persons or property. Most common sense would be never, um, and that's kind of where uh, a common sense pilot will, will live, but the actual answer is you are allowed to drop um, objects um, that will not endanger property or people. Strange, I know, but hey, that's what it is. Question 27. What is the maximum speed below 10,000 feet above mean sea level within... Uh, GIS, uh, not GIS space, all airspace. A, 150 knots, B, 200 knots, C, 250 knots, D, 300 knots. And yes, it's 250 knots. The maximum speed below 10,000 feet above mean sea level is 250 knots in New Zealand airspace. This does not apply if the minimum safety speed of your aircraft uh, which, again, need, will need to be proven in a flight manual should you get questioned, states that the minimum flight speed is 250 knots, uh, or over 250 knots. I know, i.e. the space shuttle, that's a bit retarded, but eh, we could throw Concorde in there or whatever you choose. Um, or you are flying at an aviation event, uh, so air shows and stuff like that. Yep, strange but true. 28, which of the following statements is true? I hate these ones personally, but there we go. A. The minimum height you can fly above a town is 1,000 feet above any object that is within 600 meters of a point directly below the aircraft. B. The minimum height you can fly above any area is 1,000 feet above any object that is within 600 meters of a point directly below the aircraft. 
C. The minimum height you can fly above an open air assembly of persons is 500 feet if they are within 150 meters of a point directly below the aircraft. Or D. The minimum height you can fly above an open air assembly of persons is 500 feet if they are within 600 meters of a point directly below your aircraft. There is a good reason why I hate these, um, but it does mean that you have to read and reread. The answer is A. Uh, the minimum height you can fly above a town. B covers an area or any area. Um, so the minimum height for a flight over a city, town or settlement or open air assembly of people is 1,000 feet uh, above ground level. Um, or any obstacle that is within 600 meters of your aircraft. The minimum height anywhere else is 500 feet above ground level, obstacle, person, vehicle, vessel or structure that is within 150 meters of your aircraft. You must also never operate at a height which is less than you would need to execute a force landing without causing a hazard to people, property on the ground. The only exemptions are, again, within that limitation of common sense, taxiing, takeoff or landing, uh, go around or breaking off an approach. So you can see that there are a lot of very right figures in wrong places. And the only way that you can uh, correctly identify the answer is by knowing them. So. Minimum height for a flight over a city, town, settlement, or open air assembly for people is 1,000 feet AGL. So, uh, that rules out the, um, the any components of that. Um, uh, the minimum height anywhere else is 500 feet. Um, Above ground level, obstacle, person, vehicle, vessel, structure that is within 150 meters of your aircraft. Um, so that rules out. Which one does that rule out? C and D. Um, the only way that you're going to be able to do this is is by knowing that. It is a thousand feet above AGL, uh, uh, above ground level, or any obstacle that is within 600 meters of your aircraft. Minimum heights elsewhere, um, so open air assembly, settlement, town, thousand feet, and 600 feet um, within your your aircraft's vicinity. Um, elsewhere, 500 feet, uh, or. 150 meters within the, your aircraft. Read it, reread it, read it, reread it, commit it to memory. That's the only way you're going to survive a question like that. Thankfully, there isn't a ton of those. 29. When you're allowed to fly lower than the minimum, when are you allowed to fly lower than the minimum flights for VFR flight? A. Takeoff and landing. B. When in a low flying zone, C in an emergency, D all of the above. You guessed it. <coughs> all of the above. If the purpose of your flight is to fly lower than normal heights, i.e., agriculture, power line checking, um, you still must not cause a hazard to those on the ground. Only passengers required for your flights can be carried. You must not fly lower than than that required, and you must remain within a distance necessary for the flight i.e. now that you are below 500 feet you cannot go for a cruise uh, away from the point where you are working. Um, aeroplanes however must still remain 150 feet from any person, vessel, vehicle structure that is not associated with that flight. When an instructor holds a current instructor rating he or she can simulate an engine failure after takeoff below 1000 feet and simulate an engine failure in flight that starts above 1000 feet down to below 500 feet if in a low flying zone. Uh, a current instrument pilot on IFR training, uh, testing or practice VFR flights, IFR descent to uh, DA and MDA, etc. apply. 
operating in a low flying zone, operating at an aviation event. Those are the only times you can do it. Are you allowed to carry out aerobatics without an aerobatic rating? A, no. B, yes, as long as you're above 1,500 feet. C, yes, as long as you're above 3,000 feet. D, yes, as long as you obtain clearance from ADC and are above 1,500 feet. Knowing that there are three yeses, we can immediately rule out the no answer. And the answer is yes, as long as you're above 3,000 feet. And the reason for that is that you must carry out aerobatics within 600 metres horizontally. You must not carry out aerobatics within 600 metres horizontally from a city, town or settlement or over an open air assembly of people accepted particip participating in an aviation event. To do aerobatics in controlled airspace, you must receive ATC, but that wasn't stated. Uh, and the minimum height for aerobatics is 3,000 feet if you do not have an aerobatic rating. And I know it didn't say that you didn't have one, but you also must presume that unless stated, um, it's it's the, 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 the least common denominator. But of course, now once you've obtained your aerobatic rating, you must uh, you may carry passengers. What height are you then able to operate down to with passengers on board while carrying while you carry out an aerobatic maneuver or maneuvers? A. One thousand feet. B. One thousand five hundred feet. C. Three thousand feet. Or D. No passenger can be carried with an aerobatic rating, and you all, you must also be an instructor. 3,000 feet. Minimum height for aerobatics is 3,000 feet if you do not have an aerobatic rating or you hold an aerobatic rating and are carrying passengers. If you hold an aerobatic rating and no passengers are on board, you can do aerobatics down to 1,500 feet. Um, you can perform aerobatics below 1,500 feet if you hold an aerobatic rating. Do not go below that height authorised in your aerobatic rating and are in an aviation event. What must the pilot in command ensure whilst carrying out parachute operations? A. Anyone on board not parachuting must be wearing a parachute. B. The aircraft is allowed to be operated with the door open or removed. C. The parachutists have, br have briefed the pilot in command on their descent. D. All of the above. What must the pilot in command ensure whilst carrying out parachuting operations? All of it. The PIC must ensure anyone on board not parachuting is seated and wearing a seatbelt for takeoff and landing, wears and knows how to use an emergency or reserve chute, and has been briefed on the emergency procedures. All of the responsibility. Anyone that is parachuting will not accidentally interfere with the controls and are briefed on the emergency procedures, and the pilot in command must be briefed on the parachutist's planned descent prior to takeoff and be satisfied. The parachute drop is authorised by a parachute organisation, adventure aviation operator or direct or the director. This is a nice one. Do you need a tow rating to operate as a tow pilot? A. No. B. No. If you are only towing objects other than gliders and you have a CPL or ATPL. Uh, C. Yes, you must have a tow rating to tow any object. D. Yes, you must have a tow rating to tow any object and carry passengers. Do you need a tow rating to operate as a tow pilot? The answer is no. If you are only towing objects other than gliders and you have a commercial pilot's license or an air transport pilot license. If towing an object other than the glider, you only need a tow rating if you hold a PPL. CPLs and ATPLs are not required to hold that tow rating as they are deemed to be so much more proficient than PPLs. The aircraft must have a tow hook with quick release and the aircraft must be able to maintain a positive rate of climb at 
all altitudes you intend on flying. But you must not carry passengers while towing any objects that are not gliders. Remember that last one? You must not carry passengers whilst towing objects that are not gliders. So banners and all of that stuff, it's a no-no. Well done. So I hope you got 100% on that. Um, if not, nip back. Oh, why did I do that? Look, lesson 4, part 1. It's not lesson 4, part 1. I broke this down into 3 because the whole thing was getting too long. Apologies. Um... I hope you got 100%. If not, go back, um, redo the video, and then jump on it. Uh, keep doing it until you get 100%. You get 100% there, irrespective of, of the questions that are under this section. Um, you're going to get yeah, 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 80 85% pass, right? Because they're constantly dreaming up new and interesting ways to ask, ask the same question. Like that um, a crew member that has been drinking. Uh, but is not a member of the crew of the flight. Yeah, watch out for that one. Please, if you like this, do me a favour. Like it, subscribe it, sign up for updates, share it. Tell other people um, if it's helping you. If it's not helping you or I'm doing something wrong, tell me. Um, much rather get this right. All right, listen, best of luck, safe flying.